Dr. Robert Vinoy, Old Testament History, Lecture Number 24. We were discussing Genesis chapter 22, which is the high point of Abraham's faith. I had begun discussing that at the end of the last hour. Let's go back and pick up on that. In verse 2, Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, his son, with his own hands. The background for that command is that he is told to sacrifice the son through whom the promise was to be realized. Abraham at this point did have another son, Ishmael, through Hagar, but the promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac, not through Ishmael. So if you go back and look at Genesis chapter 21, verse 12, you read, Quote, but God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. End quote. But the promised line of the seed is to come through Isaac. If you go back a little bit further to Genesis chapter 17, verse 18, you read, quote, And Abraham said to God, quote, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing, end quote. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of twelve rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. End quote. So in chapter 17, verses 18 through 21, it is explicitly stated that this line is to continue through Isaac. That is why in the last class hour, when I read Calvin's comments on Genesis 22, he says, The conflict in Abraham was between the word of the Lord in connection with that promise, and what he was telling him to do at this point. It was a test of Abraham's faith, which he was able to sustain. I think the theme of Genesis chapter 22 is the phrase, quote, God will provide, end quote. You find that in verse 8, where Isaac is speaking. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. End quote. Then in verse 14, after Abraham was ready to slay his son and the Lord prevents him, he sees the ram in the thicket and offers him for a burnt offering instead. You read in verse 14, quote, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. End quote. I'm reading from the King James translation. If you translate that, quote, Jehovah Jireh, end quote, which is transliterated from the Hebrew, it is the same expression, quote, the Lord will provide, end quote. Then the last phrase of the verse, as it is said today, the King James translation, I think, obscures this, says, quote, in the name of the Lord, this will be seen, end quote. If you are consistent in your translation, you will translate that phrase again as, quote, in the mountain, the Lord will provide, end quote. Because the word that is translated, quote, provide, end quote, all the way through here is a passive form of the Hebrew verb, quote, to see, end quote, literally. Let me go back to verse 8 in the NIV where it says, quote, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, end quote. If you translate it literally, it is, quote, God will see to something for the burnt offering, end quote. It is a good translation, but you should be consistent with, quote, see, end quote, all the way through. The NIV says in verse 14, I think much better than the King James, 
quote, the Lord will provide, end quote. And then, quote, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided, end quote. So that is the primary thought that is being emphasized in the narrative in Genesis chapter 22. Quote, the Lord will provide, end quote. And the Lord provided the lamb, and he provided his own son as a sacrifice for sin. The King James Version says, quote, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, end quote. Quote, shall be seen, end quote, obscures the emphasis on that phrase. Now, in verse 12, when Abraham has been obedient, God says, quote, Now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, end quote. Quote, for now I know, end quote. Wouldn't God have known before? Certainly in his omniscience he knew the strength of Abraham's faith. Certainly God was at work to strengthen Abraham to meet this challenge. I think it is best to understand an expression like that as an anthropomorphic expression. I think that is the technical term used when things that are very human refer to an attribute of God. The main point of the text is really for Abraham himself to demonstrate his trust in God, and to us the faithfulness of God. He was drawing a parallel between pagan sacrifice of the children and the nature of this text. What is the intent of the passage in which God called upon Abraham when pagans were willing to sacrifice their own children? Would Abraham be willing to sacrifice his own child? Elsewhere in the Old Testament, you have a strong condemnation of human sacrifice, which, of course, raises difficult questions here, but only to a certain extent. In Walter Kaiser's book, Old Testament Ethics, page 262, he says, quote, Genesis 22 has been represented as a divine command to commit murder in its most horrible form, and therefore is totally out of character with the holiness of God. In the next paragraph, he discusses a bit further, saying, quote, The law clearly prohibited human sacrifice and spoke scornfully about those who ordered their sons to be offered to Moloch. End quote. He says Genesis 22 does not encourage such sacrifice because the narrator is exceedingly careful to introduce his account as a test. True, this notation was meant to help the reader, not Abraham but an event must be judged by its wholeness, not by its introductory command. So Kaiser makes that distinction and then emphasizes in his own discussion that the thing that is highlighted in this is God's mercy and grace in providing. He says, if it be objected, what kind of a God would subject man to this type of ordeal? The answer depends on which part of the narrative is emphasized. If the initial command to sacrifice Isaac is stressed, then the resulting image of God will be one of deception. But if the intervention of Yahweh to stay his raised hand and his subsequent blessing of Abraham is stressed, then one's conclusion will agree with Roland DeVoe, who says any Israelite who heard this story would take it to mean that his race owed its existence to the mercy of God and its obedience to the prosperity of our ancestors. In other words, he says, you shouldn't really focus on the pain, but rather focus on the mercy of God in providing a substitute. Now, I'm not sure that solves the problem. Certainly, I don't think you can say, well, Kaiser does further and brings up a very difficult question. Kaiser says on page 263, Gerhardus Voss surprises us with the estimate that the divine command to sacrifice Isaac distinctly implies in the abstract the sacrifice of a human being cannot be condemned on principle. It is well to be cautious in committing oneself to that critical opinion, for it strikes at the very root of the atonement. Quote. Kaiser's statement is Voss's point, that Abraham is asked by God to offer life, the life dearest to him, his only son. 
but with the last-minute intervention of the angel, a substitute of one life, in this case a ram's life, for another is announced as acceptable to God. Quote, Therefore, Voss concludes, not sacrifice of human life as such, but the sacrifice of average sinful human life is deprecated by the Old Testament. End quote. Kaiser, pages 263 through 264. Now, Kaiser, at that point, says, quote, I hardly know what to make of Voss's line of reasoning. How could any human life, known to man after the fall, function as a gift, much less a substitute to God? I've no biblical qualms about the principle of substitution, for that is germane to the text itself. But I cannot agree that Isaac, as human life, functions here to point theoretically or principially to the blood atonement. End quote. Kaiser rejects the analogy that Voss seems to be pushing. The emphasis of the passage falls on the test aspect and the grace and mercy of God, and of the maintaining his promise unaided by any conniving assistance from some from some of the promise's first recipients. So in principle, what is being addressed here is the idea of human sacrifice where life is atonement. Kaiser gets to that, but he sees no human life actually could do that. He would prefer simply to look at this as emphasizing the test aspect, the grace and mercy of God providing an alternative. So I don't know how much you want to dwell on the parallel between human sacrifice, which did exist among other cultures, and what God tells Abraham to do here, because certainly the law of the Old Testament is against any legitimacy to human sacrifice. Now I think what I said there, as far as the parallel with Golgotha, is the passing of that smoking furnace with the animal in Genesis chapter 15. Here is the parallel in chapter 22 with the New Testament text. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. God was willing to spare his son in order to provide for our salvation. Abraham was willing to spare his son to be obedient to God. Abraham had total confidence in God. God had given a promise that his line would continue through Isaac. Therefore, when the Lord said to take his life, Abraham was convinced, if necessary, that God would raise him from the dead. So he took God at his word, did not doubt his promise, and was obedient. That is the thing to focus on. When you get into the question of how God could command Abraham to take the life of his own son, that is very hard. What Kaiser tries to do is back off that and say it is never God's intent ever for Abraham to do that. The focus should be on the mercy and grace and the provision in the text. I don't know if that's the best answer or not. He could have done it, and God could have, as Hebrews says, raised him from the dead, so that his promise would not be voided. All right. Let's go on to Abraham's lapses, failures, and weaknesses. Certainly Abraham was a great man. You see the greatness of his faith in chapter 22. But he was not a perfect man. The Bible shows us weak points as well as strong points, not only with Abraham, but with other prominent figures in the Old Testament. So he is a hero of the faith. He is represented as such, particularly in the New Testament. For example... Romans, Hebrews, and James. But he's still a sinful man. The grace of God is primary in his life, not his own goodness. He has weaknesses, but God overrules and works in spite of those weaknesses. So in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis 20, Abraham represents his wife as his sister, as an expedient to help himself. In Genesis 12, he goes down to Egypt to seek food because of the famine, shortly after he comes into the land of Canaan. You read in verses 10 through 13, quote, There was a famine in the land. He went into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous, 
And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, he said to Sarai his wife, Behold, now I know thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, when it comes to pass, the Egyptians will see you, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save you alive. Say, I pray, you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and my soul shall live well because of you. He fears that his wife's beauty will lead to an attempt on the part of the Egyptians to get rid of him because he is her husband. He calculates that if he says she is his sister, perhaps that will lead to the opposite, and he will be given favors and good treatment. That is the tactic. It seems to have been something that was agreed upon by Abraham and Sarah, and perhaps used in other instances, because they did a lot of traveling. If you look at Genesis chapter 20, verse 13, where the second incident of this occurs with Abimelech of Gerar, you read, quote, And it came to pass, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said unto her, This is your kindness which you shall show to me. At every place which we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. End quote. That is a half truth. It is not a total falsehood because Genesis chapter 20 verse 11 says, quote, Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet indeed, as she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife, end quote. She is really his half-sister, who became his wife. So when they say to someone, which apparently they did at numerous places, that Sarah was his sister, it was true. But certainly it was a deception, because she was also his wife, and only his half-sister. Now, a question was raised here the other day. How would Sarah have been so attractive at age 65 or 90? You get the ages by looking at Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. It says, when Abram left Haran, he was 75 years old, end quote. Compare that to 1717, in which Abraham says, quote, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? End quote. You find there that there is a ten-year difference in age between Abraham and Sarah. So that means when Abraham left Haran to come down into Canaan, he was seventy-five. That means that Sarah in chapter 12 was sixty-five. If you go further, Genesis 21 verse 5 says, quote, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him, end quote. Isaac was born just shortly after, see chapter 21. So Abraham was about a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born, and Sarah was about ninety years old at that second incident. You read in Genesis chapter 23, verse 1, that Sarah lived to be 127 years old. Now, with respect to her beauty and age, what was the average age of menopause when people were living to the age of 125? Today it is 45 or 50 years old. If an average lifespan is now about 50 years less, perhaps menopause also about 50 years less or at about 75. Now I'm guessing this is pure speculation. It seems to me you could speculate that menopause when people were living so much longer may have been, instead of 45 to 50, at about age 75. If it was 75 for her at age 65 or 90 to still have a great deal of beauty is not unreasonable. I guess many of you saw the news maybe two or three weeks ago. Florence, the oldest woman in the world, died at about 114 a resident in doctor's nursing home here in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. My wife was caring for her for the last couple years. It is a remarkable thing, somebody that lives to be 114 years old. We think that we are way off, but Sarah lived to be 127. That's not a whole lot more. In any case, Sarah's beauty 
leads them to take this approach to try to avoid problems for Abraham. Sarah was taken into the harem of Pharaoh, and exactly as Abraham suspected, he received all sorts of gifts. You read that in Genesis 12, verse 14. It came to pass, when Abram had come into Egypt, that the Egyptians beheld the woman, and she was very fair. And the princes of Egypt saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And then, verse 16, quote, He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants, she asses and camels. End quote. Verse 19 said, quote, I might have taken her to me as my wife. Now, therefore, behold your wife, take her and go your way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, Send him away and his wife and all he had. End quote. Now, what are we to make of this story? Why is this story included? It seems that the point is that we seek God's grace and, and preservation of Abraham and Sarah in spite of their human sins. God intervenes in the midst of this impossible situation, brought about by this tactic of Abraham and Sarah. The significant thing is related to the promise line of the seed. God protects Abraham and Sarah so that they will be the bearers of the promised seed, even though they get themselves into that predicament. The Lord delivers and keeps that marriage intact, the marriage through which the promised seed will come. In Joseph Free's book, Archaeology and Bible History, page 55, there are a few comments on this passage. He says, quote, A possible reason for Abraham saying Sarah was his sister rather than his wife is furnished by the discovery of a papyrus document which tells that Pharaoh had a beautiful woman brought to his court and caused her husband to be murdered. End quote. One can see why Abraham wished to be understood that he was the brother of Sarah rather than her husband. In other words, his concern might have been legitimate, but that certainly does not justify the deceitfulness. The other thing he notices, or makes a note of, is that the casual reader usually takes no particular notice of the indication that Abraham had camels among his possessions in Egypt. Verse 16 says he had sheep, oxen, men servants, maid servants, she asses, and camels. I think I mentioned earlier that Bible critics have often thought it anachronistic to say that camels were domesticated. So this cannot be reliable at this point. Free says that there is archaeological evidence showing early knowledge of the camel in Egypt, including statuettes, figurines of camels, plaques bearing representations of camels, rock carvings and drawings. Camel bones, camel hair, camel rope, these objects, some 20 in number, date from the 17th century B.C. to the period before 3000 B.C. So you get down into this argument of interpretation of the archaeological data, and according to Free, there is good evidence. Camels were domesticated long before the time of Abraham. Secondly, in chapter 20, where the same tactic is used a second time, you read in verses 1 through 4, Abraham journeys toward the Negev to Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, You are but a dead man, for the woman whom you have taken, she is a man's wife. For Abimelech had not come near her, and asked, Lord, would you slay a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister? And she herself even said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands have I done this. The result is that Sarah is released again. Now I think to understand chapter 20, it's very important that we look at the context of chapter 20. And notice the background to what happens in chapter 20. If you go back to chapter 17, you read in chapter 17, verses 17 through 19, 
Quote, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old, and shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son indeed. You shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and his seed after him. Down to verse 21. Quote, my covenant will I establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear unto you at this said time in the next year. End quote. So in Genesis chapter 17, verses 17 through 19, it is told Abraham and Sarah that at this said time in the next year, Isaac is going to be born. Look also at chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, where there are two other statements. God said, I will certainly return unto you according to the time of life, and Sarah your wife shall have a son. End quote. And then down in verse 14, after Sarah laughs, he says, quote, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. End quote. So in chapter 17 there is, quote, the set time in the next year according to the time of life, end quote. And in chapter 18, verse 10, quote, at the appointed time, end quote. And in chapter 18, verse 14, quote, according to the time of life, end quote. The interesting thing is that almost identical phrases occur in Second Kings chapter 4. This is the Hebrew of what is translated as, quote, this set time, end quote, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 21. The Hebrew of chapter 18, verse 14, quote, at the time appointed, end quote, and the Hebrew of chapter 18, verse 10, and chapter 18, verse 14, according to the time of life, end quote. Second Kings chapter 4, verses 16 through 17 says, quote, he says about the season, when the time comes, you shall embrace the sun. And she said, Nay, my lord, man of God, do not lie to your handmaid. And the woman conceived and bore a son at the season that Elisha said unto her according to the said time. End quote. In the context, those statements are Elisha's promise to the Shunammite woman that she would have a child, a son. It is an identical expression in the Hebrew. In Second Kings chapter 4, verse 17, quote, at that season, unquote, is the same Hebrew expression, quote, it's at that said time, end quote. Quote, this season, end quote, is also that expression. It's just transliterated in two different ways. Quote, then according to the time of life, end quote, is translated, quote, when the time comes and according to the set time, end quote. But it is the same phrase in the Hebrew as it is in Genesis chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Now it seems quite clear that what Abraham and Sarah are told is that within a year they are going to have a son. In other words, they are going to have a son at, quote, the set time according to the time of life, end quote. What is that time of life? Is the time of life a year or is that the term of pregnancy? It may be the latter, so it may be that Abraham and Sarah were to conceive almost immediately, according to the time of life. At this time, in the next year, they were going to have a son. That is all background to Abraham going to Gerar in Genesis chapter 20. He goes down to Gerar and tells Abimelech, quote, she's my sister, end quote. And Abimelech takes Sarah into his harem. And then the Lord comes to Abimelech and says, quote, You're but a dead man, for the woman whom you have taken, she is a man's wife. End quote. So what we see is that God, in his grace, preserves Sarah as the mother of the promised seed, and God's intervention prevents any suspicion or doubt arising who fathered the child to be born. That certainly is not Abraham's doing. But God is working out his purposes in and through Abraham in spite of his weaknesses and protecting that promised line.
Right after the Abimelech at Gerar incident in chapter 20, quote, The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore a son unto Abraham in his old age, at the said time which God had spoken to him. End quote. Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. So the Abimelech incident happens between the point of the promise of that and the realization of it. And so it seems the significance again is in relation to this preservation of the promised seed through Abraham and Sarah. Now, this backs up a bit. Abraham had been promised a seed way back in chapter 12, and in chapter 15 that promise is repeated. Genesis chapter 15 verse 4 says, quote, Eliezer shall not be your heir, but he that comes forth out of thine own loins shall be your heir, end quote. But Sarah remains barren. And you get to chapter 16 and read in the first verse that Sarah, Abram's wife, bore him no children. So Sarah says to Abram in verse 2, quote, Behold, the Lord has restrained me from having children, and I pray, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children through her. And Abram hearkened back unto the voice of Sarai. After Abram had dwelled ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, his wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. End quote. Hagar may be a maid she had received when they were there in Egypt. It is quite possible she was an Egyptian. It had been ten years that the promise had not been fulfilled. So Abraham takes Hagar, and a son is born to him through her. Abraham and Sarah looked for a different way to fulfill the promise. They tried to arrange by these means for Abraham to have a son. That sort of an arrangement sounds rather strange to us, but it was not something uncommon in that time. Reference to this kind of an arrangement are found in Hammurabi's Law Code and in the Nuzu texts, other ancient texts of that sort. I brought two volumes of Chronicles News of the Past which is an Old Testament history, or rather, a history of the Jews in newspaper format. This is, quote, Abraham and the New Faith, end quote, an exchange of letters between Abraham and Melchizedek. Quote, Sodom and Gomorrah wiped out in worst disaster since the flood. Mysterious blaze, quake, sweep the valley of Sidon, end quote. Then there is foreign news, What's going on in Egypt? Here in Babylon to Hammurabi. See, Hammurabi is about 700 years old. Abraham is about, well, the dating is not entirely accurate. Generally, this is quite good historically. Jake, quote, Jacob protests son's arrest, spy hunt in Egypt, accused, denied, charged of espionage, end quote. They came to buy food, quote, for their starving family, end quote. There are a lot of very humorous things in this, too. There is a copy of this in the library if you want to look at it sometime. But the reason I mentioned this, in the third one of these, there is an article, quote, Sarah versus Hagar, court rules Hagar, stays, affirms Ishmael's rights, end quote. Then there are excerpts from Hammurabi bearing on the Sarah versus Hagar case. The quote there from Hammurabi's Code says, quote, If a man married a woman, and she did not provide him with children, and he has decided to marry again, that man may marry a second wife, bringing her into his house, but with that second wife ranking in no way with the first. If a man married a woman, and she gave him a female slave, who then bore children, if later... That female slave has claimed equality with her mistress because she, the slave, bore children. Her mistress may not sell her. She may, however, mark her with the slave mark and count her among her slaves. If she did not bear children, her mistress may sell her. If a man's first wife bore him children and his female slave also bore him children, if the father has ever said, My children, to the children, 
whom the slave bore him, thus having counted them with the children of the first wife, then after the father has gone to his grave, the children of the first wife and the children of the slave will share equally in the goods of the paternal estate, the firstborn of the first wife receiving the preferential share. That shows the practice of taking a slave was something that was known in the time of Hammurabi and regulated by law. Well, we'll stop there and pick it up next time. Dr. Robert Vinoy, Old Testament History, Lecture Number 24